Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Wes Johnston, CEO of the Telecommunications Industry Association. And I am joined today by Rick Corker, the president of Nokia's North American Operations. And we're going to talk a little bit about 5G. Rick, first, thank you for joining us. Hey, Wes, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. 5G, of course, uh, very much on our mind, very much on your mind. I think we both had the opportunity to, um, to go to Barcelona uh, to participate in Mobile World Congress. And it was impressive to see the global investment in 5G. And while impressive on the one hand, um, you know, living in the U.S., it does lead to the question of, you know, is the U.S. investing adequately? Is the U.S. still in the leadership position that it used to be? 3G to 4G, very much U.S.-led. Um, and I know there are many that are interested in the U.S. leadership position. So what are your thoughts on the U.S. leading uh, in the market for 5G? Well, I think the answer is yes. I think the U.S. will lead in 5G, but, and there's a big but. So let, let's go back a step. You mentioned the transition of 3G to 4G. And I think that really was a turning point for the U.S. industry, particularly in the wireless industry, where we, we saw the U.S. step up and take a leadership role. And we, we saw some huge benefits from that. We, we saw massive investments. We saw GDP growth over $100 billion. We saw an 84% increase in jobs in the wireless sector and billions of new revenue for, for the operators and companies across the U.S. So the, the, the basis of, of why we think 5G will be successful is already there in 4G. But there's a lot of work that we still have to do in 5G to make that happen. Is there, is there a natural place that you see where U.S. leadership is likely to dominate relative to the rest of the world? Well, I think it is that, that transition we saw with 4G and, and the innovation that created, right? So we've built an ecosystem here in North America, which is almost second to none. So just think about the companies that have leveraged the technology, the 4G technology we built around LTE. We've created a, an ecosystem here with, with fantastic infrastructure, so massive investments in, in the networks. But there have been companies who have been able to leverage that. So, you know, the, the usual one, you think of companies like the Googles, the, the web scale players, the, the Ubers of the world, how they've been able to leverage that technology to create new, new businesses for us. 5G, I think, is just going to be an extension of that and even more opportunities for companies like that to, to emerge. So, so I think the innovation footprint that we've built in North America, both from the businesses, from the operators who have built that, but also then from the vendors like ourselves, who are then are prepared to invest in that ecosystem because we can see there are opportunities for us both now and in the future as well. Well, that's, that's a terrific uh, segue for me because um, the TIA and Nokia have enjoyed a long-standing relationship and we, we appreciate the, the global relationship that we have. But give, me, give us a sense of some of the investments um, that Nokia is making in its leadership role, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or even globally. Yeah, yeah, obviously. So, so 5G is not new for us. We've been planning for 5G for a long time. So I think when we think about you know, technology leadership, you know, Nokia has been there. Um, we, we now own Bell Labs, and so for someone in, coming from, from Nokia, the fact that we own Bell Labs, that's pretty cool. So when you think about the technology that's going to be integral to 5G, a lot of that has already been invented by us at Bell Labs. So things like massive MIMO technology, beam forming technologies, we invented that. So we've been planning and thinking about 5G for a long time, so we've been investing in that. We're a big believer in industry associations and standardization work. So we're heavily involved in developing the standards for 5G. So that's really important because we need an ecosystem that clearly works and allows everybody to play equally in that ecosystem. And then, of course, then from a technology leadership perspective, you know, we're investing heavily, uh, certainly in our radio technology. You know, 5G is, is a new, new technology. But 5G is so much more than just the radio technology. So we're also investing in the core networks, the backbone networks, the, uh, the application analytics, and the things that are going to run over 5G to, to really make it work. So you know, we've, we've been investing heavily. And, and what we've seen now, of course, here in North America is the, the 5G race has really sped up. And that's meant now we've had to accelerate a lot of that. And that's been great because what we've been able to do here in North America is invest heavily with the operators on early technology trials. So we're putting technology out there in the network, and we're learning a lot. So there's lots of talk about millimeter wave. So that really allows us to build massive capacity in the networks. But it comes with some unique challenges around how far does it go? Does it tra transfer or propagate through trees and through walls? So those early trials have really allowed us to learn a lot around what can be done with 5G. And I think we've, we've been surprised by actually some of the advances we've made already around those early trials. And that allows us to invest in more in R&D to, to continue to build that technology. So it's, you know, this acceleration has been really exciting for us. Well, you, you, you took a couple of words out of my playbook around, uh, we like to focus on delivering connectivity and accelerating and empowering innovation. So 
um, a lot of what you just um, shared is very much rooted in the next generation of connectivity and all of its implications, but, and, and it's hugely important, um, but I'd like your thoughts on uh, the innovation aspect of things. And, and in this case, not so much the innovation of the underlying technologies, but um, you know, I used the expression earlier, there are business models emerging that will emerge in two or three years that we can't envision now. Yes. Um, so the applications and use cases of these underlying technologies, of the different layers of 5G, because there are layers to it, as you know, I mean, where do you see the use case innovation in particular? Yeah. And, and what kind of leadership role is Nokia uh, exhibiting in that? Yeah, well, I think that's the, the multi-billion dollar question is, you know, what is 5G going to give us that perhaps 4G doesn't today? So the way I look at it, I, I kind of split it in two things. So if I look at it from a consumer perspective, you know, what is 5G going to provide initially? It's going to provide greater capacity, more throughput, lower latency. So the user experience will, will certainly improve. And, and let's not forget that the rapid growth in data, that's not slowing down, right? So all the things that we want to do today, we're going to want to do faster and better in the future from a consumer perspective. And think about moving from to high definition 4K, 8K video. You know, 80% of the traffic today is video, but it's gonna be super high definition video in the future. How do we cater for that? Um, how do we start to augment that experience with uh, you know, augmented reality. How do we build that digital world on top of the real world? We're going to see those sorts of applications. So I think there's a lot in the consumer space that's going to be the same, but, but better, but also some new applications. But I think where the real business model innovation is going to come is actually in what we would refer to as the industrial internet. Because I think the real revenue opportunity for, for companies like ourselves and, and for the operators and new players, because I think 5G will open up the opportunity for new players to come into, into this sector, is really around digitization of the enterprise. So when we look at 5G as a technology, massive bandwidth, super low latency, that really lends itself to a whole range of new industries around whether it's automotive connectivity, whether it's remote healthcare, whether it's gaming, so, you know, and, and, and industrialization of robots in factories, because today a lot of that is, is still quite complex, and we think 5G will enable that. So we think there'll be a lot of unique business cases around trans, digital transformation of the business, because that's going to be something that is enabled by 5G that we've only partially been able to address with 4G today. And that kind of use case innovation, do you see, is that coming from within, in this case, Nokia? Is it coming from your partner ecosystem? Where do you see some of the innovation into the different, the applications into the different uh, verticals in particular? And secondarily, um, is there an industry that has you more excited than others? I mean, healthcare is the largest, uh, part of the U.S. economy, right? Yeah. Almost 20%. Uh, you mentioned manufacturing. Um, we could talk about retail. We could talk about professional services, hospitality. Um, there, there's no shortage of opportunity, but where, how do you see it playing out and what sorts of investments uh, are you making to capitalize on it through yeah. yourselves and through your partner ecosystem? Yes, yeah, so maybe for the first question. So, of course, we're looking to develop applications. A lot of what we're developing, of course, is the connectivity and the ability to enable these applications to run. So we will have our own applications. We have artificial intelligence programs to help operators more efficiently run their network. We have technology applications that allow us to, spl to slice the network so we can create almost like unique individual network environments for people. So a lot of that will come from within Nokia. But as you said, it's really an ecosystem. And uh, we're working with, with a lot of our partners, both on the operator side, but also in, in industries, you know, web scale players, small companies who are innovating on top of what 5G will bring. When we look at the, the landscape, I, you know, I guess we talk a lot about things like the internet of things, the, the, the industrial internet. I think that's one area that we, we get quite excited about because it, it's such a broad thing. But even within that, then we start to narrow it down. So what are the areas that we would focus on? I think you mentioned healthcare, definitely one you know, huge opportunities for improving people's lives through technology, right? So if we can reduce costs and provide a better level of care through remote automation, remote tools, remote diagnostics, I mean, I think that's a huge benefit for everybody here in the North America. So healthcare, definitely one. Automotive, you know, we're, we're, we're a big part of the automotive, um, autonomous driving scene, providing networks to enable that. Um, so we've been very active in doing that. We've done a number of trials, both here in North America and in Europe with, with the auto manufacturers. Um, and, and energy and transport. So, you know, we've tried to, I guess, not boil the ocean from an Nokia perspective. We're trying to pick segments where we think we can add the most value and focus on those. And then there'll be an ecosystem which will develop applications, you know, right across the spectrum. And as you said, I mean, I think what we don't know is we, we don't know. And in two or three years, 
we're going to be using applications we never thought of. And I think 5G will help enable some of that. Yeah, we've, we've approached it from the perspective of it would be a mistake to think that um, you can accomplish everything in a year. Clearly, that's a mistake. When we take a look at some of the investments we're making, for example, in smart buildings and the program and the entire ecosystem that's required, you know, what struck me about that was just how advanced the thinking is among the partner community around the various use cases. Because um, you know, the leap from 3G to 4G had its own uh, set of characteristics, but the leap from 4G to 5G really is empowering the, the, the equipment manufacturers, the operators, and, and the partner ecosystem around, wow, okay, what's possible? So enabling all of that, of course, is Spectrum. We've got to find a way to free up Spectrum. Of course, the FCC has been active in low band, um, the, the uh, TV, the aux uh, incentive auction, and yeah. Spectrum repack. Um, there's activity at the high band, but give us a sense of of how all that's coming together for, for Nokia and where you expect to capitalize. Right, no, that, that's when I, I said, can the US lead? Yes, but, but I think the but is, is very much around spectrum. It's certainly one of the key aspects of it. I think the FCC has done a fantastic job. So if we look at the pipeline of spectrum that's coming through, you mentioned the, the incentive auctions, the low band, that's been an incredible lift in terms of spectrum availability. And we, we see operators leveraging that, not just for 4G, but for 5G going forward as well. We've seen quite innovative work from them around CBRS, the 3.5 band, where we're doing spectrum sharing for the first time, which is quite unique, something unique to the US. And, and we're now seeing things like the Airwaves Act, where we see a lot of high band spectrum coming through. So I think there's a lot of activity in that space. We see also a lot of interest in, in mid-band. Um, you know, I think when we look at the competitiveness of where the US is relative to some of the, the other countries, whether it be China, Japan, or Korea, they've allocated up to 100 megabits, 100 megahertz, sorry, of spectrum per operator in, in that mid-band spectrum, which allows them to build nationwide deep capacity and coverage networks. We don't have that yet here in North America. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges going forward. Now, some operators do have. We have a lot of 2.5 spectrum, which, uh, as we've heard, will probably be leveraged for 5G as well. So I think there's a huge funnel of spectrum that's coming our way, which is encouraging, but the challenge is time. How quickly can we get that spectrum into the hands of people who can use that spectrum to build networks to enable, enable the ecosystem? So I think for me, there's a lot of great work, but we, we need to do it quicker. Yeah, and I think uh, to your point, we're also going to need um, support from Congress on a number of items. Uh, I know we've been working together, taking up the cause of how do we streamline the process for network infrastructure deployment? Because when you take a look at the implications of 5G on you know, uh, the advent and growth and proliferation of small cell and backhaul, you get into a lot now, a, lot, a number of new platforms that need to be, for which there's permitting, and I know um, we've been active in that, but you know, what are your thoughts on how that plays out? Yeah, I, I think you know, that's been something that's been a little un underestimated in terms of the complexity. We talk a lot about spectrum and the ability to roll it out, but the reality is you have to be able to roll this out. And as we know, 5G, predicting the millimeter wave, I mean, these cell sites are maybe only one or 2,000 feet in terms of circumference. So you have to have a lot of small cells to build the equivalent of what we have today in terms of LTE coverage. So, you know, and what we're finding is that it's, it's still far too complex, time consuming and expensive for the operators to build those small cells. And we're seeing that even today in LTE, and that's gonna be uh, magnified as we go into 5G because you know, we, we're gonna need three, four, five times the amount of small cells as we plan for LTE. There's been some good progress. I think there's been some great work from the federal government in terms of simplifying some of those processes. A number of states have implemented that. It's certainly uh, simplifying it. You know, some of those recent uh, changes in regulations, uh, we estimate have freed up over $100 uh, million worth of uh, investment that, that can go back into, into investment in the network, not just in trying to find sites to build the network. So we, we need to move that from the federal level down to the local level because at the end of the day, there's still at a local level, we need support. You know, it, it can't cost us $80,000 to deploy a small cell, and we've had that experience here in North America. It simply won't scale. So siting reform, I think, is a, is a, is a key uh, item on our agenda, and we're supporting that through, through the TIA, and we appreciate your support on that, but also through CTA and, and, and our own lobbying. So it's a critical one if we want to build that infrastructure. Now, we look forward to working with you on it. One last question. <clears throat> I want to paint a scenario for you. Um, You've got 185 yards up the hill into a gentle wind, and the pin is set in the back right. And you've got two options. You can play safe to the middle of the green, or you, or you can take, challenge the bunker and go right at the pin. But if you do, you bring the rough into play, and I, you know, the short game, it's tough. So how do, you, how do you approach that? How would you play that? 
and that's a very simple cut five iron into the wind, left to right into that back right hand pin, no layup. Oh, I'm really liking this guy. <laughs> Rick, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for joining us on behalf of the entire TIA community. Thank you for joining us. Great, Wes, and again, we really appreciate the, the great relationship and the work that we have with TIA, and we look forward to continuing that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.